Welcome back, Wargamers, as we round out our lore discussion on Broken Realms Marathi. And if you tuned in throughout the entire last week, thank you all so much. And if you're just jumping in here, stop what you're doing, go back, listen, and because it's really going to be important for context here. So last week, I walked through the entire like story arc, right? Marathi's manipulation of Sigmar to get into the eight points, the great Varanite heist, as I'm going to call it, her battle with the Deepkin, and eventually her ascension to godhood that took her on a journey into the guts of Slanesh. And then rounding it all out, in Act 3, uh, Anvilgard was corrupted from the inside out, with the now goddess Marathi, the Shadow Queen, taking the city and renaming it Har Curon. And those were some meaty videos. It was a wild ride in its own right. But there are some consequences to these actions that I wanted to talk about in a dedicated video. Because while I while the main story was covered, I didn't touch on those small little lore blurbs here and there scattered throughout the book. And that's because, you know, it's much easier to make this video series if I stay like laser light focused on the main story. But these little blurbs come together in giving us a way better understanding of how this tale has much bigger ramifications than even Marathi had considered in all of her scheming. And so that's exactly what we're going to get into right now. So let's kick it off by talking about Van Brecht. He is the Lord Veritant, who, who kind of dominates most of the story here. And we're going to kick off with him because he was there in the eight points during Marathi's betrayal, but he didn't actually witness it happen. And later, he was stationed at Anvilgard in the third act. And while he and the other anvils of the Heldenhammer and their Stormkeep were all defeated, not a single one made it out to warn Sigmar. Instead, the Stormcasts were captured, chained, and hidden away in deep prisons. And so their message would never reach Azir. Well, after Van Brecht passes out at the hands of Marathi at the conclusion of Act 3, we get a little mini-story like two pages long afterwards. Essentially, he's tied up in some kind of prison or stockade. He's being mocked by a scourge privateer when there's a knock at the prison door. The guard goes to it and is immediately struck down. Some creature, unknown to us the reader, has carved a trail of murder and bloodshed into this place. We're not even quite sure where this prison is. And well, all we can really surmise is that it's obviously looking to free Van Brecht. Like I said, trail of corpses and doors ripped wide open, and after he's freed from his bindings, Van Breck just walks right out. He faces no opposition and eventually makes his way outside. And I love the description of what he sees. Remember, this is his savior. Clinging from the spar of a bladed tower was a figure wreathed in shadow. He could see the creature's eyes, pinpricks of crimson light boring into him. He caught the impression of a pair of bat-like wings unfurling and there was a sudden rush of air. In an instant, the thing was gone. Now, what was remarked upon earlier in the scene when he killed the uh, the Scourge Privateer Guard is that there was a claw arm. So a claw, it's a very interesting thing. And I'll be honest, what this thing is is not spelled out. I don't think it's a Kinyurai because it seems too, I don't know, animalistic for that. But I do wonder if this is a scant bit of information that we have on Malarian, right? Maybe it was one of his. And now he's now taken the more bestial form in AOS from the little bits that we have of him. And I like to think this is an emissary of his who saw what Marathi did and is trying to leave as many quote unquote chess pieces on the table as possible. So he wants to free Van Brecht so that he can be used in later machinations. I just wanted to share that bit because I do think it's our first glimpse at Malarian's boys and just the act of freeing Van Brecht means a great deal. He's seen Marathi's betrayal firsthand now, and already has the God King's ear. Now, the next two points I'll lump together because there's not a whole lot of information on them, but this story leaves Archeon's plot to open a zeer like a can of beans wide open. Okay, you see, we know that Marathi's spies had in fact discovered a large Varanite vein in Varanthax's maw. Okay, that's the mine where all this stuff took place in Act 1. And we know that he was going to use it to melt the gate leading to Azir from the eight points so that 
you know, the uh, Grand Marshal of the Apocalypse could walk straight into the home base, which has been so safe up until now. And while that information was used by Marathi to get Sigmar on her side and move into the eight points, there's nothing that actually says she fulfilled her promise and stopped Archeon's plans. We know that she killed a boar worm and harvested Varanite from it, but we don't have anything that indicates she destroyed the mine or the rest of the Varanite. She just left when she got what she needed. So it is entirely possible that Archeon can use the remaining amounts to enact his plan, or at least some iteration of it. In addition to that, one little thread that we need to keep in mind as we read these books going forward, Archeon has a new weapon that scares the heck out of Sigmar. A spell, seemingly a kind of a area of effect one, that can pull Stormcast Eternal Souls into war shrines, essentially a magic power that negates the Stormcast Eternal's ability to be reforged. The souls literally cannot go back to Azir. This has huge ramifications for the already like beleaguered and stretched thin army, because multiple times in the history of AOS, the death of a Stormcast Eternal has been used to solve a problem. Topple a realm gate, relay a message, those kinds of things. They just teleport back to Azir but the risk of true death makes those things far too dangerous. Like I said, there's not much on either of those threads, but I wanted to bring them up because I want them to be in your minds as we go into further Broken Realms books. There is a super weapon and there's a plan to get into Azir. Now, for the main event, okay? And I'm gonna do some reading here for you, just a few snippets, because I don't, I don't do a lot of the reading on air, but the first is a prophecy relayed by Glavia Sinhart, who you may remember as the Herald of Slanesh that was tracking Marathi throughout this book. Okay, she's been following these visions sent by the God of Excess, and uh, one of these is a prophecy written down for us at the very start of the book. The Dark Prince stirs, squirming against his twilight bonds. The sweet song of his faithful echoes from all corners of reality. With every shriek of agony and howl of trembling exultation, his power swells beyond the ken of his dull-witted golders. One by one, the god chains are sundered, each fractured link concealed by the prince's impenetrable illusions. In their arrogant self-certainty, the elf lords fail to grasp what is coming. To the prince of perfection, a progeny shall be born. The screams of shackled lightning shall herald its coming. The bitter oaths of the betrayed shall be its birth song. All will be decided before the walls of the great deceiver's fortress. The ocean will churn, the shadows will writhe. When the serpent's head splits in two beneath the glare of a crimson moon, then shall the newborn come forth. At the zenith of exultation, it shall slither from the belly of its father, and the realms themselves will quiver to witness its glittering magnificence. Now, when you first open this book, this is gibberish, okay? We have no context for the thing. We, have, we don't know who Glavia is, even though it's like attributed to her as a quote, but we can now see that Marathi, in her arrogance, has fulfilled this, okay? So again, this is a prophecy. I'm gonna go through it here really, really quickly and just point out some things. Um, all will be decided before the walls of the Great Deceiver's Fortress. My understanding is, quite frankly, that it's an Olgu or Hish, because those are the mid... Because Slanesh's prison is in between them. The closest you can get is one of those realms. The oceans will churn. Again, there was a huge naval battle that took place with the deep can, all that kind of stuff, right outside of it. And the shadows will writhe. When the serpent's head splits in two beneath the glare of a crimson moon. Of course, there was a lot of crimson fire and stuff arcing up into the sky, and Marathi was asundered into two different forms. Then shall the newborn one come forth. So the reason I think that this is super important is it kind of, to me, explains Glavia's plot in some of the, the why she's in some of these things, right? Um, Slanesh is trying to communicate with her outside of his prison. Hey, listen, some things are going to go down. Here's what I foresee happening. Try to make those events happen. And Glavia's part is making sure that those events do happen. She wanted to ensure 
that um, Marathi got the Varanite, because without that, she couldn't do her ritual. And if that ritual didn't happen, the serpent wouldn't be split in two, which is ultimately what she did. Um, that now makes me think that her role there was to stop the Deepkin from interrupting Marathi's ritual. And so she's kind of weaving this whole little side game, right? She's on a side quest that is having huge ramifications by allowing Marathi to do what she wants to do. The irony being, you know, the greatest enemy of any elf is Slanesh, and this is all part of his plan. Now, there are two blurbs at the very end of the story, so this whole thing is like sandwiched in between Slanesh goodness, if you will, which is a very uncomfortable place to be. I'm going to read these to you, and they're just like a few sentences each, so here we go. The newborn screamed across the sky, leaving a trail of brilliant iridescence in its wake. It was an amorphous, protean thing yet to choose a configuration befitting the magnitude of its creation. Where it passed, it turned stone to quivering flesh, birthed lakes of honey-eyed saliva and plowed valleys of pristine glass. The Dark Prince's faithful followed close, weeping tears of joy to see such divine corruption. The prophecy of partuition had been fulfilled, and soon they would look upon the face of their beloved god and know true ecstasy. Finally, the newborn came to rest in a shadowed hollow in the earth, a fitting cradle echoing to the agonized wails of the long-dead souls. Hedonites came in their thousands to witness the birthing. Soon the hollow crawled with writhing, swaying worshippers lost in rapturous delirium as they looked upon the pulsing sphere of potential that was the newborn. As the skies above howled in protest, a shape began to emerge within the embryonic glow. A winged form, so beautiful and terrible to look upon, that many present died there and then, lost to the throes of purest rapture. As the gathered faithful prostrated themselves, the newborn began to speak its first profane words. So it's left very open as to what all this means. But man, that is one heck of a cliffhanger. So I'm going to walk through a few theories that I have. Obviously, this is Slanesh's child. We don't quite know necessarily what caused it. We know it had something to do with Marathi. When Marathi went into Slanesh, something happened, whether her essence was pulled from it. Maybe there's going to be like, you know, Nega Marathi, you know, where it's just like an evil dark version, kind of like how there's like Nega Sonic or whatever. Um, it could be something like that. It could also be something where, you know, this is quite frankly, a Games Workshop way to revise Slanesh with a new image, something that quite frankly, isn't tied to the 80s cocaine era bender kind of thing that they had before. Now, it also could be, quite frankly, like a new god. You know, it's based on Slanesh and the elven souls within it. So there's a lot of different avenues that this can go, and it makes it a very exciting time in Age of Sigmar lore. Because there's not a ton of times where we get to be on the ground floor when new things happen. You know, a lot of the uh, Games Workshop lore is very set in stone from the beginning in terms of like, these are the four chaos gods. They've always been there and that kind of stuff, you know, or it's very like, it's just... It just is what it is. But this is one where massive events are happening based on the decisions that our characters are making. And I think it was the perfect amount of uh, cliffhanger and interest to, to kind of go forward. And between this and the other things that we discussed as far as, you know, some dark secret, you know, uh, order that's trying to help Van Brecht escape and Archeon now possibly being able to get into his ear, and even if Marathi did somehow shut down or take enough Varanites that plans out, he still does have a spell that is detrimental to the existence of Stormcast. So there's a lot of things going on that I'm so excited for. And again, this video was more just recapping some of the aftermath. It's not specifics or anything like that. I would love to hear your theories in the comments down below. What would you like to see out of the newborn, which is the, obviously the son or perhaps a, a new embodiment of Slanesh. And what does that mean for the old one? Like what happens to the Slanesh in the prison if the newborn is its own thing? 
I'm excited to learn all about it. I'd love to read your theories down below. Thank you all so much for watching and following along last week and in this video. It's meant the world to me to see the videos do so well. So if you know somebody who would be interested in them or learning more about AOS, go ahead and share them. Again, it's very humbling and thank you all so much for the kind words and comments. And I look forward to seeing you in my next Asia Sigmar lore series. Thank you and happy wargaming. Hey everybody, I hope you enjoyed that video. It was made possible by the folks over here to the left. These are my top supporters over here on YouTube and on Patreon that keep this channel going. If you'd like to learn more about how to become a supporter and get some cool things in the process like exclusive pictures and interactions with me and get your questions answers here on the channel, go ahead and click any of the links down below or the join button on the community page over on YouTube. Regardless of your choice, I wanted to thank you so much for joining me with this video and I look forward to seeing you in my next one. Happy Wargaming.